So we're talking about chi-squared tests, and now we're going to continue our conversation about goodness of fit tests, which is the exact same type of chi-squared tests we did on the M&M data. So for starters, what are the conditions for a chi-squared goodness of fit test? Well, randomness is still around, and dependence is still around, which typically means the 10% condition. And then the third condition actually doesn't have anything to do with normality, because if you remember the shape of these things, they're definitely right skewed. But we do have one about large counts. So other than the randomness condition and the independence condition, we have to have all of our expected counts at least five. Not the observed counts, not the ones we get from the data, the expected counts that we actually calculate. And we do have to show the calculations for these. We have to actually show these values. And remember we said in the last notes not to round these. So all of our expected counts have to be at least five. So example one is about landline surveys. It says according to the 2000 census of all U.S. residents age 20 and older, 19.1% are in their 20s, 21.5% of U.S. residents are in their 30s, 21.1% in their 40s, 15.5 in their 50s, and 22.8 are 60 plus. So from the 2000 census, that's the distribution of ages that they got. And that's supposed to represent all U.S. residents. So it says the table to the right shows the age distribution for a sample of U.S. residents age 20 and older. Members of the sample were chosen by randomly dialing landline telephone numbers. Do these data provide convincing evidence that the age distribution of people who answer landline telephone surveys is actually not the same as the age distribution of all U.S. residents, like the one from the U.S. Census up here? So apparently 1,048 people in total were randomly dialed, and that's the distribution of ages that the, that the sample data collected. So we're going to run a test, and it's going to be a chi-square test, to see if this is significantly different than the distribution of ages found by the U.S. Census in 2000. And we know to do that because it says, do these data provide convincing evidence? That's our cue to do a significance test. So we'll start with the state step. So we want to test two hypotheses, the null and the alternative. And the null hypothesis would say there's no difference, right? So the age distribution of people who actually answer the landline telephone surveys is the same as the age distribution from the U.S. Census. And then the alternative hypothesis would say pretty much the exact same thing, except it would say those two distributions are not the same. So we can say the distribution of people who answer the landline telephone is different than the age distribution for all U.S. residents. And don't forget, we got to mention the alpha level. We'll use 0.05 here. Okay, for the plan step, we've got to name the test first. So we can say, if the conditions are met, right, if we meet all three conditions, we'll do a chi-squared goodness of fit test. So let's start with the randomness condition, which should be good, because in the problem it states that the members of the sample were randomly chosen because they randomly dialed landline telephone numbers. And for the independence condition, well, there was a total of 1,048 people included in the sample, which is definitely less than 10% of all U.S. residents. And then for the large counts, we actually have to go through and show these. So let's calculate each one of the expected counts for each category. So for the first category, if 19.1% of people are actually in their 20s, like the census said, 
then out of the 1,048 people sampled, we would have expected 1,048 times 0.191, which is 200.168 for our expected count. And remember, we're not going to round these. And so the next value is 21.5% for the next category. So 1,048 times 0.215 gives us 225.3. The next category has 21.1%, so 1,048 times 0.211 is 221.1. The next category, 15.5%, gives us 162.4 for our expected count. And the last category is 22.8%, so an expected count of 238.9. So we've calculated all of these, we've showed our work. Now, let's just make a note and say, well, they're all at least five, so that condition is met. And just a reminder, don't round these. You can keep at least one or two decimal places. All right, and so for the do step, similar to what we've seen before, there's two things that we need to show in the do step, the test statistic and the p-value. So in this case, the test statistic isn't a z-score or a t-score. It comes from the chi-squared distribution. So our chi-squared test statistic, we start with our observed count. So let's start with 141 as our first observed count. And then we subtract our expected count for that category, which was 200.168, square the difference, and then divide by the expected. And we do that for each category. So the next category would be 186 minus the expected count for that category, which was 225.3, square that difference, and divide by the expected count. So we start to demonstrate the pattern. We get a little bit tired, so we just put plus, dot, 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 and we'll skip all the way to the last one. As long as we can show the first couple terms of the sequence, that suffices. And so for the last category, we have 286 for the observed count minus the expected count of 238.9. Square that difference divided by the expected count. Okay, so if we sum each of these for each category... We're looking at 48.2 for our test statistic. So our chi-squared test statistic is 48.2, which seems actually really large if you think about it in terms of like a z-score or a t-score. So we're going to use that to get our p-value. And there's actually a specific command in the calculator we'll look at. It's called chi-squared CDF. And to illustrate this p-value, let's draw a right-skewed chi-square distribution here. We'll mark off 48.2 somewhere near the top. So our p-value would actually be that little shaded area 48.2 and above. So when our calculator calculates this value, right, we'll put a lower bound of 48.2, upper bound of 1E99, Degrees of freedom would be the number of categories minus 1. So since we've got 5 categories, our degrees of freedom is equal to 4. And it gives us this extremely small value. So we can say it gives us a p-value of approximately 0. So 48.2 was so high that this area was almost 0 very insignificant in this case. Which leads us to our conclude step. So we have a ridiculously low p-value. It's approximately zero, actually. And since that's less than our alpha level of 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. So the last thing we need to do is say what that means in context. So in other words, we have convincing evidence that the age distribution of people who answer landline surveys 
is not the same as the age distribution of all U.S. residents. Okay, so we talked about chi-square CDF a little bit. Let's talk about the other command where you can actually run the entire test. So the next part of these notes says, can you use your calculator to conduct a chi-square goodness of fit test? And you can. Uh, the actual test command is under stat tests, and it looks like this, chi-square G-O-F test. So you can actually use this in the do step and put your observed counts in L1 and your expected counts in L2 and it will run the test for you which gives you your chi-square test statistic and it gives you the p-value. So that's actually really convenient. We just have to be specific. It's chi-square GOF test, not the other chi-square test. Okay, in the last part of these notes here it says when should you do a follow-up analysis and how do you do a follow-up analysis? So we're only going to provide extra info, like a follow-up analysis, when we're asked to do so. I mean, we give quite enough information just by doing the whole state, plan, do, conclude process. A follow-up analysis, in the case of a chi-square test, means you point out which category was the biggest violator. So which category is the biggest violator? Or in other words, which category contributes the most to that chi-square test statistic? So if we had to provide a follow-up analysis for this example, we'd start by looking at our chi-square test statistic. Which one of these components contributed the most to that 48.2 value? And typically it's going to be the one that had the biggest difference between the observed and the expected count. So for that chi-square equal to 48.2, which one of these categories, you know, was it the 60 plus category, this guy, was it the 30 to 39 category, this guy, which one of these contributed the most to that 48.2? That's what a follow-up analysis would include. All right, that's our first experience with a chi-square goodness of fit test. That's all for these notes. I'll see you in class.